So hi, and welcome to the Trevena Barva Press reading series. And tonight we have three really wonderful, wonderful poets. So I'm very excited to have all of you here. And thank you to those um, here attending tonight. So our first reader is Linda Havilland Conte. She is the author of Seldom Purely and Slow as a Poem, Ibbotson Street. Her work recently appeared in the Baco Bards Anthology and will appear in From the Farther Shore. She has received recognition from the Connecticut River Review, the Illinois State Poetry Society, and the National Federation of State Poetry Societies. Linda is treasurer of the New England Poetry Club. And I give you Linda. Thank you so much, Gloria, and thank you all for being here. Um, I'm really grateful to Gloria Mindock and Chirvana Barva Press for hosting this evening, and I'm so excited to be reading in such good company. I'm going to start off with a poem which is kind of a prayer, a wish for your happiness. Best wishes. Sometimes something precious lies quite close to you, but you don't see it or don't know its value or know you want it. Someone leaves it for you or brings it as a gift, some friend, some God. My prayer for you is this, that you will be a gatherer in times of abundance, that you will be ascetic in times of scarcity that you will find joy in much and little and always be in harmony with what is. So this spring I found out that an artist with a grant from Somerville Arts Council was um, interested in installing her wire writing rendition of poems at people's houses. So I emailed her, um, Danielle Kirchmer, you may know. Um, she chose that poem's second stanza and installed it in front of my house. And uh, you can see pictures of it at, on the website or just wander by in Somerville. Um, as my friend Jim O'Brien, who's here this evening, did. And um, he liked it so much, your thing, that he um, got my book, Sell Them Purely. Um, <laughs> and there he is with it. Um, and, and he said that he liked this poem. So this next poem is um, kind of Jim's pick. A Last Visit. He gamely tries to dandle his grandson on his knee, knowing I'd want that to see them together. Though next time we know he won't be strong enough and I won't bring my son. He tries to tell me some story from when he was young. He knows I like those. And he produces a photo taken out in preparation for our visit. It must have been one of the first cars his fa family ever owned, a Model A Tudor sedan. But neither of us were sure who the people in the photo were. A one-time Lieutenant Colonel for a decoy unit luring Hitler's forces to their traps, quietly declares he's tired and makes his way to bed while mom and I hover behind lest he should fall. The son in uh, that poem got married this summer. And since I read one about my son, I'm gonna read one about my daughter. It's called My Daughter. She spends long hours in the squalor of her home room alone, surrounded by inside out clothing, open drawers, half burnt candles, books, papers, paints and pencils layered in snacks and dishes. She's trying on a her to find the one she can live with, the one that makes sense with her lovely face, live figure and the world seeming all wrong posturing politicians and hungry bosses. 
Should she hide in lumberjack shirts and thick boots or change it up with bleached hair and jewelry? Wear something tight fitting or sack like? She whisks by me striding in her styles, grabbing food to go, taking my car, making me remember all the versions I had tried and kept or cast aside. So I thought I should um, share something that's um, not been published yet. So you get a little uh, fresh take on something. Um, and um, it's the first in a series of fall poems I'll, I'll be reading. Um, by the way, Lloyd Schwartz has a tremendous fall poem about leaf keeping called Leaves. And it's on poets.org and he's gonna be talking about it on Saturday. Um, you can contact the East Somerville Library to find out about that. He has Let's Talk About a Poem days and they're wonderful. So look up his poem, but here's mine. Uh, this poem was written after um, I had a foot operation last, a, a year ago. Fall footnote. He sets the chair in the tub and a tall step stool outside. You see, you can sit here and slide over. Together, we fashion the bag over the bandaged foot in its plastic boot. The bliss of warm water washes away the pre-operating room blather. Which foot is it? What's your birthday? What are we doing today? My ballot arrived yesterday. I'll vote for healing, as will he. Our ballots a poultice for a sore nation. So the next fall poem is for here where I'm at right now on the Cape. I um, recently published, as mentioned in the um, intro, this book is actually out now. Um, from the Farther Shore is a really lovely anthology of Cape Cod poems and um, New England Poetry Club is having a reading from the anthology and I'll be reading my two poems um, October 24th at three o'clock. So look that up if you love the Cape or just wanna hear some beautiful poetry. Um, So this one right here on Cape Cod is last day of September. I have to tell you, it is a spanking fresh day. And after the summer of great abundance, a cherry on the sun. Our ordinary old beach, a pink on our ordinary old beach, a pink canopy is erected just beyond the second parking lot. No brides in view but the groomsmen shimmy to some calypso music, barefoot under the blue sky. It's almost as good as the time we saw the schools of bluefish skimming along the surface in a frenzy all up and down the shore, or when I found the seal skull intact and sun bleached, the bones around the eye sockets arched gracefully and carried it back all the way from the lighthouse. The sun's brightness nearly scalds my eyes so that I won't be sad when it sinks early in these shortened days. And tomorrow when they say it will be wet and gray, I'll wake up and find praises for that day too. Here's that day, October 1st. Today is in fact gray, but not yet raining. So after a muffin, at Larry's PX, I sneak in another last walk on the beach. I find the body of a monarch butterfly among some seaweed and remember seeing it dipping and flapping in the dunes yesterday when the sun shone. I was thinking it must have missed the bus, should be in Mexico by now. And sure enough, the little body lies heavy today, wings pushed by a cold breeze.
it's hard to escape the theme of death in fall, but this poem is an imagining of a gentle sort of person. And moving on to what's next. Holding on. I died and went to the amorphous place where we go, perhaps. I was permitted to see my hands for a while, but did not recognize them. They could have been anyone's hands, straining to read the map of their story, liver spots, uneven nails. I discerned a life full of holding on. Light pulled my gaze, but I turned from the glint of it, bouncing off things, window sills, mirror lakes, high rise buildings, to the diffuse light of wide open sky where I was warmed and cupped by impossibly soft hands, also like mine, softly kneading. So that poem was rendered into a broadside by artist Michael Shapiro. So if your place needs a pop of color, and you like the poem, I have these prints for sale, signed by the poet and artist. Plug there. Um, next poem, I had to look up the name of my rock plant on my porch. And uh, that's where the title's from. Sedum Seboldii, October Daphne. The succulent teems over the edges of its pot where a bumblebee rides a wind-tossed blossom, bouncing like a bungee jumper, casting a distracting shadow on my history book. I'm visited by the ungenerous notion that mauve is really all wrong for fall. Its springy shade clashes with the reds and oranges from the maple's branches above. In my beginning is my end could apply as a concept here. Mary Queen of Scots embroidered that phrase in her cloth of state before her execution. The idea of starting anew from decay would be more satisfying than that of falling and falling forever through an ocean more deep and dark as you go till there's nothing, nothing remaining of the sun that warms this notebook and makes stripes through the railing on the geometric design of the deck mat with the repeating motive, repeating like the Fibonacci pattern in the clusters of pale mauve blossoms on this buoyant fall day. You can really go places in your mind when heading, when reading outside on a lovely day. Um, this last poem imagines a kind of reincarnation which in spring, which seems like a good place to end because it'll bring us back around to spring and uh, rebirth. Petal. I am one of thousands adrift on a brisk spring breeze Riding updrafts and downdrafts, we lurch and spin, causing first worry, then surprise and delight at the discovery that the snow pedestrians see streaming down Massachusetts Avenue in Central Square is a storm of petals wrenched from the blossoms of trees, some good soul planted in this hard place. So thank you very much. That's all from me for today. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. And our next reader is Paul Sohar. And Paul, congratulations on your award. He just won a translation award in Hungary. So um, I'm very excited. <laughs> um, he migrated to the US in 1957 as a student refugee from Hungary. He finished his higher education with a BA in philosophy and got a day job in pharmaceutical research. 
At night, though he has been writing and publishing in the language of his adoptive country, by now producing 18 volumes of poetry in translation and three of his own, his latest book is In Sun's Shadow, and it was published by Ragged Sky Press. And I give you Paul. Well, uh, here, uh, here I am. Thank you for that nice introduction and mentioning that uh, prestigious price, you know, that, uh, uh, for which I had to travel to Budapest, and, uh, but it was an enjoyable time and uh, a lot of talking and uh, meeting with artists and friends and uh, going to the opera and concerts and, and of course to the ceremony of receiving that prize. And, and, and uh, well, uh, I, uh, I decided to uh, read directly from my uh, three books in now. Uh, and it looks uh, more impressive, probably. But, and I, I, I often, uh, with a, a new audience, I always introduce myself with this one uh, uh, poem, which is my kind of a calling card, the two-minute salvation. If, if anybody heard it already and, and don't want to hear it, let me know. And, because I, I often read this. Although life exhales but one poetic line, the marketplace is crowded and the stands are sagging with words. Syllables go tumbling over unrhymed syllables. Verse climbs over verse and you get but two thin minutes or less to unpack and sell your wares. Two thin minutes to diagnose and cure the ills of the universe, plus dissect your soul and hang it out for everyone to see the bloody mess. Two minutes to lie on the altar where your heart is torn out and tossed into the shredding machine for the lack of sacrificial fire on the cool foreheads fencing you in. Two minutes to shove your metaphor into the mouth gaping at you and reach all the way down into the stomach to turn it inside out. Two minutes to strip off the clown costume and play a naked violin standing on the ceiling. Two minutes to get your SOS across an ocean of suffocating cliches. Two minutes to douse yourself with rhymes and look for matches. Two minutes to give away eternity wrapped inside a hyperbole. Two minutes to steal a pearl into the eyes before you. Two minutes on the judge's bench, two minutes in the, in the dock, two minutes on the butcher block, two minutes on the rack, two minutes on the soapbox, two minutes on the cross. But two minutes can also a, be the age of the universe if you have a well-honed secret tucked away in the pocket of your verse. And if your frantic meter doesn't cause it to sink before you reach a sunny shore of applause, hanging on to the two minutes refrain, just two more minutes, please, and then you can shoo me into nevermore. Well, so that's about the poetry and, and, and my attitude to, toward poetry. And, but uh, uh, and uh, and then I, I thought I, I, I read uh, some poems relating to my early life, and uh, I was I, I was growing up in a, a wartime situation, 
and uh, it uh, uh, is uh, uh, best illustrated uh, by um, this poem called The Last Invasion. After the local and friendly forces, after the allied forces, after the enemy hordes, and after the cockroaches and lice and rats, comes the invasion of the cats. And that turn feral without their masters and mistresses who are either dead or else have to compete with their pets for something to eat. It's hard to tell which side is more ferocious, except the cats can't get much past baby ears, but they can defend themselves against their former owners who can no longer rely on high-tech weapons. The war has used up all poison and ammo. Abandoned artillery shells are no use without cannons. The unexploded bomb in the basement, a bad joke. And leftover hand grenades, too tricky to use in such close combat. The only thing remains is man's first weapon, the club, fashioned out of anything. I used my mother's favorite broom on a rust-colored neighborhood cat, brought it down on its next neck with such force that the broom broke in, it broke in half. Huh? Uh. Yet the damn cat kept running with, the, with our supper, a rancid sausage between, a, between its jaws. And it still keeps running, even though I beat it to a bloody pulp almost every other night. And, uh, well, I, I have more war poems, remembrances, but... I also want, wanted to read, the, it's kind of a, an after effect, the, uh, maybe what they call the, uh, uh, what is this, the, uh, this syndrome, that uh, post-traumatic syndrome, uh, which I, I feel. But the trouble is that uh, it's not only in my imagination, because the world is not getting much better. And, 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 and for an interesting experiment, or for interesting for me, I'd like to read a poem that kind of demonstrates my uh, feeling, the uh, uh, leftover feelings about the war, and then uh, the new wars that uh, I uh, kept uh, running into. And, here is a poem which I wrote. It, uh, it, it's in two parts, about uh, 50 years apart. The first one is, was written in the, uh, the 1960s during the Vietnam War. And then the second one was, uh, it was continued decades later. Let me read the one first that was written in the 1960s in response to the Vietnam War. It's called Armageddon. Hurry me rapidly when it is over. Don't look down at my corpse from your bulldozer. No use in standing and waiting for answers. Worms are alone that the tongue of the stiff serves. They will get my willing cooperation, each of them chewing a well-balanced ration. Hurry me quietly when it is over. Let the dirt cover me and perhaps clover 
not fancy tales and important examples, just the same sound that around me now rambles. But I would love to have silence above me, or at least breezes born free and flown lovely. Hurry me if, if you can when it is over, just in case by some chance you should be sober. More likely it will be time to get plastered. No one could stay dry and not be a bastard. All the mines, still untouched by the disaster, will next day have to be cleansed with some nectar. Bury me deep below when it is over, so that I never again be a roamer, caught by an urge that alone is immortal, crying again at this magnificent portal. Don't let me crawl in the brightness of sunlight, seeking my blood in the mythical gunfight. And, uh, uh, okay, let me continue uh, into uh, almost up to our time. Uh, this was continued uh, uh, in the, I try to do it in the same format, but it, it didn't work uh, quite. I somehow I couldn't uh, get the same uh, form to work for me. So I, I never force any kind of a form and, and I, I don't uh, force a, a free a verse on myself or any kind of a, an approach. I let it, let the a poem dictate its own format. And, and so I, I let it go like this. Armageddon again. Bury me with the rest when it is over. Don't, don't try to look for me in the debris. Names will mean so little to a bulldozer. It will not stop and start looking for me. Bury me under the tread marks of winners, those still left standing and rushing to claim victory's well-deserved ashes as golden ornaments to their own blood-polished fame. Bury me with the books and the old pictures of the museums still burning to know who was it started this unholy mess, whose blood is searing the nuclear snow. Bury the weapons of daily destruction with my corpse guarding their innocent rust. Let the tanks cover me for, I'll be a bomb blowing up all that's left with my disgust. Bury me quietly when it is over. I don't want prayers or songs flown above by anyone else but your bloody bulldozer tramping my mass grave before you sign off. Well, um, so, uh, it's, it, 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 and uh, okay, let's uh, get out of this, uh, you know, dark uh, mood and, uh, and get into some things that I, I enjoy and, uh, uh, like nature in, in any form. I, I enjoy walking. I'd love to go up to New England and then see the uh, leaves turn, but they're turning now here in uh, New Jersey too. And uh, plenty of leaves to rake. <laughs> okay, and the other thing I enjoy uh, tremendously as uh, the opera and uh, the concerts. And so here it is, uh, New York City, in the just in the in the vicinity. So, and here is a a, a 
poem uh, inspired by a special performance. It was something so fantastic. In, it was in 1976 when uh, Pavarotti was in his prime and so was Montserrat Caballé and, uh, uh, and the two of them made such fantastic thing that they, uh, you know, I, uh, in Europe, rhythmic uh, applause is quite common, but here in this country, you never hear it. You know? And this was the only time I heard a rhythmic applause, you know, where the audience just couldn't stop applauding. It was so fantastic. So here it is. It, it's, it says, the fat lady sings, but it's not over. It, it, it's kind of a play on the word, on that saying, that it's, it's not over until the fat lady sings. Uh, but it's not over even after the fat lady sings. If the fat lady is Montserrat Caballé and she sings Mi Chiamano Mimi, and the fat tenor is Luciano Pavarotti who sings Kejelida Manina, like they did back in 1976, one evening at the Met, when the chandeliers turned into a snowfall of goosebumps, and the seats burst into a mellifluous bloom of cheers. Every note soared as a star in the extra dark bohemian night, and the curtain burned up in shame for trying to put an end to a story that was never to end, but to go on carrying the whole house past the slender storyline of a romance to a special stage where it is not over when the fat lady sings because when she sings, she pours out endless strands of a melody and she weaves, weaves them into a love story between Mimi and Rodolfo and more a love story between the fat lady and Mimi, between the fat singers and the arias glowing on their faces, between the drama and the music, between the tune drunk audience and the nectar of opera, between the traffic noise and the out, uh, traffic noise of life outside and the music within, because when the fat lady sings, everyone who listens burn, turns into a miniature live opera house where the fat lady never stops singing and the fat tenor never stops answering her call. And the two of them never stop becoming younger and more beautiful bohemians every day. Um, the opera was, you know, La Boheme by Puccini, and it inspired this uh, uh, tribute uh, to that special performance. Uh, please uh, give me a, a, a signal when I have a one minute left. And... Okay, Paul, um, just read one more, and then your time is up. Oh, that's it. Uh, okay, then. Uh, uh, Oh, I, 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 I was uh, going to talk about nature, so uh, I, I, I have a, a, a little poem. And, uh, and, uh, Oaks are all the friends I need and all the friends I've got, whether they are dressed in green or naked to the knot. Dressed they are as dressed they come from the same old mold created for the poets I like, the sacred poets of old. When the wind hums in the woods, it's the same old tale. And old tales are what I like best, for they never fail. They never fail to take me up on their knotted lines to the view of other hills where my stutter 
rhymes where oaks and beaches give the call in the same old song, tongue calling me to join them in their sacred song. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And um, our next reader is Cindy Veach. And she is the author of Her Kind by Kevin Carey Press, Gloved Against Blood, also by the same press, and was named a finalist for the Patterson Poetry Prize and a must read by the Mass Center for the book and the chapbook, Innocence, Nix's Mate. Her poems have appeared in the Academy of American Poets, Poem a Day, Agni, Michigan Quarterly Review, Poet Lore, and many other places. She is co-poetry editor of the Mom Egg Review, and I give you Cindy. Thank you. Thank you, Paul and Linda. That was really beautiful reading. Loved hearing your work. Um, so I'm going to read from my new book, um, Her Kind, which just was released um, about a week ago. And a little bit about Her Kind. Um, in 2016, after I'd been living in the Salem area for over 20 years, I stumbled on the Salem Witch Trials Memorial. And up to that point, I had succumbed to the witch kitch narrative of modern day Salem. But for some reason on that day, in that place, I was changed. I decided to write a poem for each of the 20 victims and this became a chapbook. At the same time, as I was, I was experiencing the end of a long marriage and Donald Trump had become elected. And in my mind, I connected these events with the witch trials, in particular with the female victims who are represented uh, in the book. I witch. So what if I woke up changed? It's not like I'm a wild hog or some evil thing, not a real hog that follows you home, jumps into the window, a monkey with cock's feet with claws. Don't believe what my accuser says or believe it. The fact is my divorce attorney's building sits on the side of the prison where they kept the accused in chains in 1692. I came there with a silk scarf worn loosely at the neck, borders looped with colored thread. He came with daisies, dark chocolate and proclaimed, my wife came towards me and found fault with me. Downstairs in the dungeon, they chained us to the walls to keep our spirits from escaping in the likeness of a bird. This next poem is titled Spectral Evidence. And that was something that um, was testimony in which witnesses claimed that the accused had appeared to them and done them harm in a dream or a vision. And this was allowed in the courts during the witch trials. Spectral evidence. Because she said she saw, and therefore, these pinholes in her skin on one arm to be exact, look how they crisscross make a doily of the flesh. And because she said she saw, you, not you, take a small pin from your pocket, a straight pin with a flat head. And because she said it was, it was, therefore you, therefore not a dream, puncturing each pore, you in the flesh, not flesh, with a common pin. Rebecca Nurse of the Accused, hanged July 19, 1692. At first the jury returned not guilty, to which the judge said, retire and reconsider the not. After all, she had not answered the question she had not heard. Guilty of being hard of hearing, maybe mouthing what? Guilty of having a temper, arguing with neighbors. Guilty too of piety, 39 attesting to her deep devotion. Still, the afflicted swore it was her apparition that did the pinchings and prickings of their flesh. And in court, when she raised her arms, the afflicted raised their arms. And when she inclined her head, the, the afflicted inclined their heads.
Trump has called the investigation a witch hunt 84 times. Martha Carrier, hanged August 19, 1692. They said she brought smallpox to Andover. They said she killed her father and brother, making her a queen in hell, AKA landowner. Neighbors testified it was none other than Goody Carrier who haunted them at night. They said she bit Sue Sheldon, threatening to cut her throat because she wanted her to sign the book. She stuck a pin in Dumb and Putnam, killed Samuel Preston's cow for being very lusty. And there was that devil man whispering in her ear. Somehow she caused the death of Alan Toothaker's cat. For these complaints, though each one was a lie, she was condemned by the grace of God to die. Tornado warning. When I think about it now, I'm fearless, but sometimes I still hear the hum of our minivan coming back from Iowa City, that two lane highway with too many white crosses, troopers flagging us down, ordering us to lie, belly down in the ditch, Iowa sky, imperial sky, every spiny tendril that drops from a dark cloud reminds me of the bed fear made. Silence meant trouble, a brewing. I prayed for thunder. I welcomed the cackle of lightning, rages, yelling matches. But a sudden drop in pressure, the sucking out of sound, I got good at seeing it coming, sky purpling, moving over our house, our house slanting into shadow. I went down to the cellar to weather each storm. Tornadoes are cruel, of course, I had to leave him. Ogre. Having come to a field, having come to a creek in a field, having come to seek out the beast in the knee of the field by the creek, the beast that lives in my field by my creek, having come to this apogee without a bead of belief in the hour of my need, having come in the hour of my need to my field by my creek and found him in my field by my creek, having come and refused to get down on my knees in my field by my creek, having come, having refused him, come now, Circe, disarm him. The next poem is titled, I Kikimora. Kikimora is a mythological female house spirit um, said to attach herself to a particular house and to disturb the inhabitants and particularly the, the male inhabitants. I Kikimora. The spider first classified the year I wed. Spider smaller than a speck of straw. Spider of the bog, of swamp, wetland, marsh, quagmire. A mere wisp of khaki shaft, of hair, a sphinx moth, night butterfly, invisible wraith who slips through the keyhole after dark, both beautiful and ugly, whiny, glass half empty, noisemaker, dishbreaker, home wrecker, wet footprints across his heart. Woman climbs Statue of Liberty in protest. Teresa Patricia Okumu, convicted of trespassing, 2018. She said, I climb to protest our nation's zero tolerance immigration policy. She said, I climb to abolish ICE. They said trespasser. They said disorderly conduct. When she sat on the skirts of Lady Liberty, we watched them climb after her. They said, get down. Our hero said, I'm not discouraged. She made her bed and we watched and cheered and put a curse on those who wanted to arrest her for protesting, putting children into cages. Oh yes, we witches watched her carry our truth up and over that ledge like a beautiful soothsayer, strong and lithe. Goodbye, dark ages. We climb with her. We climb with her. The 
This next poem is a duplex form, which Jericho Brown uh, invented. Um, it's an interesting form. Uh, the poem is called Watching the News in My Attorney's Waiting Room. They're burning Harry Potter books in Poland. It felt like magic when I gave him my hand. It was magic when I gave him my hand and the justice pronounced us husband and wife. I was pregnant and wanted to be his wife. They're live streaming the bonfire of books. Priests and altar boys burning wicked books. In my country, divorce is legal and books about magic aren't evil. But if I file for divorce, I'm a bitch. If I file for divorce, I'm a witch. There doesn't need to be a reason. There doesn't need to be a good reason. They're burning Harry Potter books in Poland. So I have two more poems. Um, Dear Moon, you appear have tonight. Darkness, your camouflage, chameleon, cover up. And when he says, I was only half there, I look up to you, hanging in the skylight, even eclipsed, half full, halfway. You are not a fraction. Nothing is ever missing. You are not a part, a slice, hangnail, sliver, morsel, crescent, quarter, waning, or half hearted. You are some whole, all there. And the last poem, um, I, Hakati. Hakati was a Greek goddess of crossroads. She ruled over the night, magic, and places where three roads meet. Between queen, liminal sorceress, crossroads guardian, story of my life. Who are you today, my ex would taunt. More than just a Gemini, a trimorphous, human form in triplicate. Birth, love, death, maiden, mother, crone, moon, earth, underworld. I'll take triplicity over duplicity any day. Three heads are better, even if one has to be a dog, a bitch. Dog, 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 serpent, horse dog, cow, boar. Even if it means I am witch, that old crone at the cauldron, stirring willows, dark yew, blackthorn. It took a torch, a key, a dagger to cut away a past. It took 30 years. It took all three of me. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks a lot. What a great night of poetry. Um, all of you, just amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, can we give them another round, all of them? <laughs> uh, does anyone have any questions for our readers? Don't be shy. <laughs> well, this, this isn't a question, but um, just a comment. And since I, at the very beginning of this, I. I rather conspicuously held up Cindy's book, her new book, um, but hadn't, of course, started to read it yet because I just got it. You know, I just got it uh, a couple of days ago. Um, this is a great entree into what's going to prove to be a very complexly woven, thematically woven uh, book. And um, uh, so, yeah, without I guess, saying more that I don't know how to say, I just thanks for that that opening. This is fantastic. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, I'm, I felt, this is Mary, I'm sorry. Um, I don't think the camera works on this, I'm not sure. But um, I was just interested to hear from all the readers about their process of organizing and putting together this reading. It, to me, it just felt like each of you really um, we're thinking about how each poem that you read followed the one that came before. It's just, it, it, um, so I'm just curious to hear a little bit about your process as you were choosing poems to read for tonight. Thank you.
who wants to go first? <laughs> go ahead, Linda. <laughs> okay. I'll just say, um, oh, your, your video came on, Mary. <laughs> um, so I, um, I partly I was excited about the uh, art project. So that was why I read that poem. And um, then um, I, I picked um, poems that had to do with the season because it just, it's, it's a very creative time, Fall. I feel it's um, the time when, when your juices just kind of rise because you feel like you have to gather like like a squirrel to get ready for mm -hmm. winter and um so i i seen i had more poems than i knew about october um but um yeah things just kind of fell together <laughs> i can go next i mean i think for me i was the book kind of progresses and there's a certain arc. So I try to read things from each section of the book to sort of with just a few poems, still be able to move through that arc. Okay. And Paul, do you want to answer that? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, I, I actually, I always like to, uh, say a few words about uh, every poem I read, you know, as, as I go along, I, uh, I, I, uh, I, I like to introduce myself and, uh, and talk about my background, you know, bring up poems that uh, describe my roots and, uh, and then, uh, 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 then I go into uh, things that I enjoy and, uh, 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 such as poetry, music, and nature, and and uh, and so I have plenty of uh, poems about nature, especially, and uh, so and then end with uh, uh, usually, well, lately I I, I ended with. Uh, a, a poem about my daughter who uh, passed away uh, mm. recently, and, mm. and it's it's uh, it's such a, a, a terrible thing to happen, and the only way to deal with it is to keep writing poetry about it and get it out of your system, you know, and it's this this pain, you know, and, mm. and move it out, and and it's, and. Uh, and I just uh, uh, I, I, I just didn't get to it, you know. But uh, next time, uh, uh, next time, uh, in, in 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 my uh, new book, I have a, a last section is just all about uh, her, you know, and uh, and in the family, especially your children are uh, your organic connection to this world you know? mm -hmm. and uh, and you realize that when you lose one of these your children and and uh, it's, it's it was such a sudden thing and a, a medical accident that happened from one minute to the next mm -hmm. you know and, and it's just uh, uh it seemed unreal and uh and that's uh, and what is unreal is, is just a matter uh, uh, material for poetry. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's, that's how I, I dealt with it. And, and, but it's, it's, I don't know, it's, it, 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 at the same time, it feels like it's, uh, uh, it's sort of a appropriation of, uh, of uh, uh, her life or her death, you know, for my poetry. Uh, I don't know what you, you people think, you know, is it all right to, uh, to use, uh, you know, such a tragedy, you know, uh, as uh, uh, material for your poetry? 
I, I feel that it, it really helped me a lot. And uh, uh, maybe I should keep these poems just to myself. Then, uh, no, <laughs> no I, don't, I don't think you should. No, I, I, I understand uh, the dilemma that you're addressing, but I think it's critical to be able to write and share about something that's so, so difficult and so crushing. I think it's very important. Yeah, I, I agree with David. I mean, that's your that's your grief. It was your daughter. You know, for me to write about it would make would be appropriation. It would not be right. But for you, I think that's beautiful. I do too. I think we all have to write what we write, um, and it all comes from in here, no matter what it is. Does anyone else have anything they'd like to say or a question? Sorry for your loss, Paul. And um, I was wondering, though, about an earlier poem. Um, what was going on in the world when you were uh, having to chase that cat for your dinner? <laughs> <laughs> that, that sounds like a pretty terrible time. Oh, yes. Yeah, well, that was... You know that because war is not just all about bombing, bombs and and, and killing, but starving too. And, and especially when things settle down, it's all over, and it's, you run out of food. And then what? You know, it's it's and, and so uh, I I I lived through uh, you know World War Two and. Uh, it, it it left its mark uh, in me, and and uh, and then then I, I, I so in effect I, I have poems about being a refugee myself, you know, twice in, in first in in World War Two, and then again uh, in uh, in the, after the Hungarian Revolution, you know, I was a refugee, and I left uh, Hungary all by myself and just went out into the world. I came here without knowing anybody in this country. And, uh, but it's, wow. it, it, oh. it was, and that's why it was, was so, you know, important for me. I realized, you know, after she died, that uh, my daughter tied me to this country. You know, now I have no ties to this place. Mm. And here I am sitting in my house, and and what? You know, and so I, I I came here, uh, you know, as a citizen of the world, and I I declared myself I. I didn't even want an American passport until I realized I wanted to travel, you know, and then I had to become a citizen. And then, uh, but uh, I, I thought I, I, I'd rather be the citizen of the world, you know, just uh, belong everywhere and nowhere, you know. But, you know, in this modern world, you have to... Uh, have papers somewhere, and you know, all papers tie you to a place, and uh, but these papers mean nothing, you know. The, the, the real tie is is the human, you know, uh, beings and you know, it's your family and friends, and uh, so I'm I'm staying here uh, uh, without a, a family. Well, it's it's. Uh, but, uh, have a poetry community. Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep, you have us a community for sure. And anyone else? Okay, then that will um, be it for tonight. And again, oh, thank you so much for reading, all of you. I mean, what a wonderful, wonderful night. And um, yeah. thank you. So one more clap for them. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Gloria. Thank you, Gloria. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you for coming, everyone. It's wonderful. And have a nice beautiful reading. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye, okay. Bye everybody. Thank you.
Bye. Bye. Bye.